Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com and this very special message from Brother Mike Kaler as he presents Biblical Salvation, a look at the walk of Mike Kaler. As you can see from the title, this is Mike's personal testimony as he tells of his upbringing in a Catholic home, turning to drugs and a life of sin. But Mike doesn't dwell on these things because his testimony is about how he was saved from hell and a life wasted on sin by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We would also encourage you to visit Mike's personal website ministry at 2 Timothy 2-15.org. We will flash the banner on screen from time to time as a reminder for those watching the video. As we now begin this two-part message from Brother Mike Kaler. Now, hearing everybody talk, I know that there's going to be some people blessed by, by this message here today. Um, everybody can hear me okay? Every, okay. I'll get louder as the time goes on there. <laughs> but uh, uh, especially Joyce, when I, I heard you saying what you were saying there, I, I think you, um, it's like everybody's reading my notes again here or something. I, I don't know what. <laughs> but, uh, he, he does that. <laughs> That's right there. But... Uh, uh, called it, uh, Brother Greg asked me to do a message on um, uh, uh, w what's happened to me, you know, basically my testimony. Yes. And um, I was glad to be able to do so. I, I don't like talking about myself, uh, but I will talk about things that will be a blessing to other people. Um, and uh, that's why I want to call it biblical salvation because the uh, steps that I went through, as you'll see there, it, it, it really doesn't show the, um, or prove. I, I was a bad witness to my salvation, a uh, bad witness for Jesus for many years. But um, as we'll see throughout the message there like that, that um, for God, we're saved once we believe on Jesus. And we can't lose that salvation no matter how hard we try. Um, but, uh, you know, we do affect how we communicate with others by what they see in our lives we, we become a bad witness for Christ and uh, that pretty much describes the whole thing the message is over <laughs> but um, this, this is me um, born January 2nd 1962 and uh, I was late also um, I was supposed to have been born December 18th, right around there, but uh, it turns out it didn't come out till January 2nd, and of course, mom and dad just loved me to death over it, you know, it was a, they didn't get to claim me on the tax return that six year 61 there, but <laughs> they got to carry me through the rest of the time there, so it was a, <laughs> I think with a good attorney, they could have got something going there, though, it was a <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, uh, can't put a date of death down here, but awaiting the rapture. Uh, whether we're alive or dead, we're, we're waiting for it. Amen. It's going to come. Uh, if I'm still here when it happens, I'll be meeting the other ones that have passed on in the meantime after, you know, after they get there. Uh, if I happen to go before the rapture, then I'll be one of the first ones to go up. Amen? So it's, it's good. Um, this is me probably around 11 years old or so. Uh, kind of the, I don't know, Peabody look, I guess you might say there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that middle picture is uh, uh, me around 14 years old, and uh, I was already uh, around 6'2", six 6'3", six at that time, there, at that point there, but I uh, was actually in pretty decent shape. Of course, my hair was, I had hair. <laughs> and then just a, a picture of uh, recently when we were out at uh, um, uh, the Mannings, I, I think it was, we were having a baptism. So I um, got that up there, so it's a... Uh, Kind of the walk through there. I didn't have any baby pictures handy. I would have loved to brought them because I was a cute baby. I, <laughs> <laughs> I had I have one picture that I, I was hoping to be able to get because it had me sitting on my great grandmother's lap, and uh, so it was uh, myself, my uh, my dad, uh, my grandmother, and my great grandmother. So it would have been you know it's kind of kind of neat to see all those generations in one picture. I was raised in the Catholic Church, and. Um, you know, I can't remember a time when I did not believe in God. I, I don't think there was ever a time where I did not believe in God. Um, you know, it's just like one of those things when you first begin to think, 
I, I knew about God. We were, I was raised that way, even in the Catholic Church. But it was a family that believed in God. We, uh, we were raised to believe in God like that. Um, I, I can't be called a fool because of that. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, but that did not come out of my lips there. And um, I knew about Jesus, but did not really know about salvation. And, um, you know, I, I think that's kind of sad. Uh, you know, knowing about Jesus like that, knowing who he was, what he did and such like that, but not really having an understanding of salvation. And that's where we find a lot of people these days. Uh, even people that consider themselves Christians. You, you press them a little bit, and they come up with every other reason other than believing on Jesus for their salvation. Yeah. And um, so it, I used to think I was a good person, and then one day I realized I wasn't. Um, I call that the beginning, because that's the, that's the beginning of the walk, when you realize that you're not a good person. Um, we, we talk about it a lot, that you have to realize you're lost before you can be saved. Right. And uh, that's, that's what happened to me, and I'll tell you, it was very, very real. Um, it didn't happen because of somebody talking to me, though. It was a one-on-one -on -one thing with the Lord. Yeah, I discovered I was lost, and uh, based on what I had learned up to that point, I believed I was going to hell for certain. There was no question in my mind because of what I had done that I was going to hell. When I died, I would be going to hell. Um, fortunately, after some time in reading through scripture, I found out differently. But um, I'll tell you what, being raised in the Catholic Church had me at that point that where I felt like I was lost and gone forever. I blew it already. And um, I'd gone through First Communion, and I have here, more importantly, my confirmation. Catholic Church, that's kind of like the Jewish bar mitzvah. Um, I'm, I'm now a man in the church's eyes, you know, no longer a child, so I'm accountable for my actions. And um, the Catholic Catechism, when I was going through the church or the classes, uh, taught me there were two types of sin. I learned that there was something called venial sin, which is something that's uh, um, it's a lesser sin. It's something that can be actually forgiven. If you, if you did went to the priest and confessed your sins and did your penance and stuff like that, there you were forgiven for it. You know, you had to go out and say so many Hail Marys and all this stuff. <laughs> you know, glory be to the fathers and stuff like that. You'd be to our fathers and if you said those and you were okay. Your, your sins were gone. And... Um, well, what a messed up deal, isn't it? <laughs> and then there was a mortal sin, and that was a sin that could not be forgiven. Uh, if you committed a mortal sin, it was mortal. It was a death sentence. Yeah, it was, it was, you were done at that point. So that's why you see a lot of Catholics really being careful about what they're doing, because they don't want to commit that mortal sin, or at least let everybody know that they've committed that mortal sin. You know, maybe if we kind of keep it quiet, nobody else knows about it, and we can get by with it. <laughs> I found this uh, um, picture of this page of this book here online, and it turns out this is the same catechism that I had when I was uh, going through the catechism class. And uh, it pictures down here the, uh, a boy with two different pictures of Jesus in his chest. Uh, talking about grace being in the soul and Christ is alive in you. But mortal sin kills this life and it crucifies Christ in you. Show pictures of dead Jesus inside of you here. That's the kind of stuff we were taught in the Catholic Church. As children growing up. Uh, they talk about kids being at an impressionable age. You really are. At that age, when you see something like this here, you're scared to death. I don't know how we can crucify Christ when he already died on the cross for us, though, right. and rose from the dead. Amen. It's impossible to re-crucify Christ again because of something that we've done. He defeated hell in the grave already when he rose from the dead the third day. How dare the Catholic Church come along and tell me that I've just killed Christ in me again here? 
That's baloney. I'm going to try not to get too, too angry through the thing. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But I saw that and I thought, you know, that, I remember Tom Gregg, I said, we saw that picture before. You know, we had that picture. And it just so happened I came across this online here and the, there's, there it is. I didn't have the rest of the book. It wasn't presented on there like this here, but that one page was, and I'm thankful it was. Amazing. Even it was a Catholic guy trying to push a Catholic religion. <laughs> God can use anything to his glory, amen. amen. I, was, uh, I was saved when I was 13. Uh -oh. Yep. I was saved when I was 13. Um, when I was 13, I had already been confirmed in the Catholic Church. But I've been experiencing what all the other guys, gals, <laughs> Guys in particular here, though, experience when you're growing up at that age. You're attracted to girls. I was attracted more than just to girls, so I was lusting after other women who were married. And that's something you just don't do. But my body was out of control. My mind hadn't been firmly rooted in this idea here either about what was right and what was wrong in that sense like that so much. I was looking at things more along the lines of a sin. I did learn what was right and what was wrong. But when you're going through that, though, those things can kind of overpower your thought process. Something that scared me to death happened. I was reading in my Do Away Reams Bible and came across this portion of scripture. And I put it up here um, the way the Do Away Reams has it. And I, I got a few more verses like that. Uh, you won't see me putting up stuff like this while I'm giving a regular message. I'm, I'm King James only and proud of it. I've investigated it, I've checked it out, and I've found that it's the only Bible we have that's infallible. Amen. Uh, there's no error in it. You go and you start checking it out there and everything matches up so tightly, it's just, it's amazing. No author could write a book like that, except for God. Amen. Amen. Matthew 5, 28 says, But I say unto you that whosoever shall look on a woman to lust after her hath already committed adultery with her in his heart. And there was that word adultery. And I'm thinking, oh boy. See, I'd read, heard about the Ten Commandments already also. And uh, it's considered a mortal sin if you break any of those Ten Commandments. And I read that, and I remember what I read here in the Exodus, and uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. But it says that if I love after another woman, and I've already done that in my heart. I've committed adultery. Catechism class taught me too that if I broke any one of the Ten Commandments, I committed a mortal sin. Um, Catholic Catechism goes into a bit more detail because they want to make sure that you're roped into this uh, type of thinking here. But, as far as I was concerned, I was doomed. I was going to hell when I died. Right? Because I committed adultery in my heart, lusting after married women, and now all of a sudden I broke one of the Ten Commandments. So, as far as I was concerned, I was going to go on to hell. You know, but you talk about 13 year old wanting to stop life at that point right there. there there's, I don't think there's a bigger problem that you can face at a young age like that than to realize that when you die, you're going to hell. Especially for somebody that believes in God and knows that he's able to do that and will do that. I was scared to death. I knew I was lost. I truly believed I had committed a mortal sin and was going to burn in hell when I died. I have said here, my life was over at the age of 13. And it, and it was a horrible feeling. It was a terrible experience to have to go through that, to think that at 13 it was done. All the rest of my life wouldn't make a difference what I did anymore because I couldn't bring Christ back to life in my heart based on what the Catholic Church had taught me.
I went over the next few days. Um, I, I was depressed. <laughs> That's the best word I can put down for it. Or, um, even though I felt like I had you know, committed that mortal sin, um, I was still reading my Bible. And um, that tells me something about things what now, you know, especially looking back on those days, that uh, even though I felt like I was, you know, from a standpoint of even a person that doesn't believe in God, if they're still reading your Bible, there's something kooky <laughs> about you. you know. If I'm done with God, why would I even care about reading his word any longer? The more I read it, the more doomed I am. But here's what God showed me from the Douay Reims Bible. Brought me to Ephesians. And it says, And you, when you were dead in your offenses and sins, that was me, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of this air, of the spirit that now worketh on the children of unbelief, in which also we all conversed in times past, in the desires of our flesh, fulfilling the will of the flesh, and of our thoughts, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Um, I, I just want to reiterate the point that this has come from Douay Reims. It's similar to what you read in the King James, but if you compare the two, there's differences. Uh, and in some places, they're not, it's not even subtle. About as subtle as a brick. <laughs> but, uh, he says, but God, who is rich in mercy for his exceeding charity, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together in Christ, by whose grace you are saved. And I, I'm still wondering. I, I think that's why the Catholic Bible you know, doesn't use the uh, uh, Dewey or Reams anymore. This is kind of contradictory to what they want to teach. Amen. Saved by grace? What do you mean? And he hath raised us up together and has made us sit together in, hev in the heavenly places through Christ Jesus, that he might show in the ages to come the abundant riches of his grace in his bounty towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, for it is the gift of God. I, I read that. I was thoroughly confused. I felt relief. A huge sigh of relief. But I was thoroughly confused because this is contradictory to everything I was learning at the time. <clears throat> By grace you are saved and not of, not of yourselves? I had to work to get my salvation. It's a very works-based salvation. There's nothing to do at all with grace if you listen to what the priest is saying or what you're getting in catechism class. Apparently they haven't read their own text. But um, I had, like I said, I had to read this several times for it to sink in correctly. But um, I did. I felt a huge feeling of relief when I read this the first time. It was a few days after I'd read that I was lost and going to burn in hell forever. But now all of a sudden I'm experiencing the fact that there is a, a, a loving, forgiving God and that apparently there is a way out here now. Amen. I started learning about grace at that point. Um, something that's given to you that's unearned. It's unmerited. You can't earn grace. It's given to you. Amen. And, and thank God it is because if it wasn't, we'd all be burning in hell after we died. Even though at this time I had been saved, you know, in the sense that we speak of salvation as believers, I didn't know I was saved, but I knew I wasn't going to burn in hell. I mean, that doesn't make sense when you say it now, but at the time when I was 13, I, I felt that way. Um, it wasn't until years later that I actually discovered that I was saved on that day when I read that portion of Ephesians. Amen. Things started clicking in there. You know, the Lord kind of brings you back to points in your life 
points things out to you. And um, you see, I, I'd already believed Jesus had died on the cross. I believe that he had been buried and that he rose three days later again from the grave. Um, that much I was being taught in the Catholic Church. You know, unfortunately, I think a lot of times they teach that just as a way of trying to keep you under their thumb because they're Christ's representative on, on earth. That's, they're like Christ on earth. Uh -huh. So if you're, if you're going against what Jesus does, you're going against, or you're going against them, you're going against Jesus. Um, and, and that's not the case either. That's not the case. Now, I'm not uh, by any means def uh, defending that uh, do away Reams Bible, but it was the Bible I was using when I got saved. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, God, yes, he can use anything to see that you're saved. Um, it can't be defended, though. That do away Reams version cannot be defended. Uh, it's not, cannot be defended as being in the inerrant word of God. Uh, they don't even really care whether it's in their word of God or not. It's just something they can pull out every now and then to speak of to get people to thinking that they're really the person to talk to. But I want to point something out to you here for just a second. We're going to take a little sidelight here to this. Uh, blatant error, as I call it here, is Genesis 3.15 cannot be justified as the word of God. Genesis 3.15, the Dewey Ray Reams version, says, I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head, <laughs> and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. Wow. That's blasphemy. Wow. That's blasphemy because all of a sudden you're making a woman the Christ. You're trying to take Mary, who was the mother of Jesus, who lawfully brought Jesus into this world, and trying to elevate her to a position that's above Jesus Christ. Wrong. Amen. Mary herself, if it was possible, would come down and tell him, you're wrong. Amen. I don't know if anybody else noticed it either, but they put enmities yeah. in here, as if there's more than one. <laughs> That helps to soften that a little bit more. Uh -huh. All of a sudden, there's not only one that you have to be concerned about. There's, there's many. It takes away some of that blame from Satan. Getting ahead of myself here. I got the stuff right here and couldn't see it. There isn't. <laughs> Let's see that. With this here, the, um, the Catholic Catechism, the, the Catholic Church, uh, is elevating itself above the Word of God. They're, they're literally changing the Word of God here. And there's a specific reason why they do it. They were laying the foundation for Mary worship here with that Genesis 3.15 uh, verse. The Catholic Catechism, paragraph 82, and I thank the Catholic Church for making it so easy for me to prove you wrong. <laughs> you got everything categorized and arranged so well, I mean, it's just a piece of cake to go in here and show you exactly where you're wrong. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> they say, as a result, the church to whom the transmission and interpretation of revelation is entrusted does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. Baloney. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Somebody was smoking. Uh, you're not kidding, Mark. I tell you. you know what I see here? Tradition must sometimes be elevated above scripture. Right. What did Jesus say about tradition? Your traditions make the word of God of non-effect. Yeah. Right. But they're saying you must allow tradition. Not according to what Jesus said. 
Not according to the ones you claim you're being the only representative here on the face of this earth. Said. A person doesn't become a pope by not believing this stuff. A person doesn't become a priest by not believing this. If you're a priest or a pope or a cardinal or archbishop or any of these other titles they give themselves in their hierarchy, then you believe this. And you do not believe the word of God. Plain and simple. Your tradition is more important than the word of God. Your degree in psychology and philosophy comes before you start going into becoming a priest in the Catholic Church. And that's what's more important to you. How can I convince people? How can I explain things in a philosophical sense that makes them believe that we're more powerful than the Word of God? It's, it's evil. It's evil. I mean, there's no other way of putting it. It's evil. Amen. It's a very well-planned and thought-out way of corrupting people. I come back here to, um, to uh, my salvation again. <laughs> Get off of that for a second there. But uh, according to scripture, not their tradition, thankfully, I was saved that day I read Ephesians 2. Um, I got to throw this in here too, though, because <laughs> I run across people that sometimes, and especially in my past, there were, you can't explain it. And you can't pass their, are you really saved because you convinced me, test, that you're not saved. Uh, no. Scripture tells me I'm saved based on very specific Amen. words. If you believe it or not, you know, I, there's nothing I can do for you on that. That's between me and the Lord. We're saved because I, I, I know what I've done. I know the Lord forgave me because of what he said. Amen. Okay. I don't, and like Greg said, we don't have to count on the man to get confirmation of our salvation, if you will. Amen. Um, I call them the spiritually gifted folks because that was always one group that always did that all the time. <laughs> Tried to get on you about that stuff. There is, well, no, you didn't do this. You aren't speaking in tongues, so you're not saved. You know, that's, whatever. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Thankfully, I was pronounced saved by God's word. Amen. And um, with that being said, and I can't slam just the Catholic Church, I got to slam myself here. Because um, the things that I did after I was saved um, sure didn't help my case. I, and that, that's putting it real lightly. Um, I would not lose my salvation. But I certainly did lose much reward. And, and I gained a whole bunch of shame. Um, that shame can sometimes kind of bring you back in line sometimes when you think back about things. You know, uh, kind of wake you up sometimes. Or, um, I was saved, but I did not know it. I knew I was lost and on my way to hell, and I was truly sorry for the sins I had committed. I believed in God. Most importantly, though, I believed that Jesus had died on the cross, was buried, and rose from the dead three days later. I, I truly believe this in my heart. Uh, if you would have been asked me to explain it at the time, I couldn't have done it. I, I wouldn't know where to have started at that point like that. But, you know, I, I look at it now, and I'm thinking, we're saved when we believe that. Not when we can give an explanation to somebody that fits their idea. Um, by some people's word, I wouldn't have been saved at that point. And, and like I said.